So the Workers' Action Centre is an organisation that supports workers who don't have a union. So they could be in temp, contract, part-time, casual types of jobs, experiencing violations of their rights, uh, facing discrimination at work. And so we work with workers to deal with the issues that they have in the workplace, but then actually do a lot of organising to improve those conditions broadly, systemically across Ontario, but also in individual workplaces as well. What we're trying to do is to involve workers in the broader labour movement, to get them involved, even if they don't have a union, even if they are not connected to any other organisation, how can we encourage people to not just be victims of wage theft or violations of their rights, but actually through the process of, of dealing with a problem at work, to talk about the broader political issues. Why is it that so many workers are facing violations of rights at work? Why is it that you didn't get paid your overtime pay? Why is it that you feel that you're gonna lose your job if you say something about health and safety at work? And through those political discussions, we are encouraging people to get involved in the organization, to become a member, just like a union member, and then get involved in campaigns and organizing and education, and really build their participation in uh, fighting for better wages and working conditions. Over the last 20 years, we've seen this huge increase in precarious work. We've seen jobs move from being full-time and permanent and having benefits and pensions to jobs that are casual, contract, on-call, relief, that are short-term, that have no benefits, no pensions, wages have declined. In fact, you know, in Ontario right now, we have about 1.5 million people who make you know, $15 or less an hour. That's a huge low-wage economy that we have in Ontario right now. In addition, what we see is people having lack of access to dental, drug benefits. Employers are just not providing that anymore. We're seeing workers now um, only accessing work through subcontractors, through franchisees, through brokers, through temp agencies. Um, they don't even have a relationship with their employer anymore. And so what we see is that workers are nervous about organizing around uh, our that people's expectations for what they should get in a, in a job are being completely crushed. And so, you know, you talk to any young person nowadays or actually anyone who's looking for a job nowadays, and if they get a six month contract, they think they've got a, you know, they've, they've hit the jackpot, right? Um, and if they've got benefits, well, you know, they, they're set. Um, so this concept of having a decent job, this concept of actually having decent wages, of having benefits, of, of a job where your employer actually, you know, is responsible for your wages and working conditions is, is now becoming sort of an anomaly, right? It's becoming a myth. And I think that that really is of concern to us and I think should be a huge concern to everyone. So the types of conversations people are having right now are, you know, why do you have a pension? I don't have a pension. Why do you have benefits? I don't have benefits. That's not fair. And, you know, or we should be grateful for having any type of job. And I think what our organizing has done has, to is, has been to change that conversation, has been to say, why can't we have benefits? Why can't we have pensions? Why can't we have decent jobs? Who is making these decisions? And is this inevitable? And I don't think it's inevitable. I don't think that globalization, technology, and the labor market um, are the decision makers here. I think it's our government and our employers that are the decision makers and have made very clear decisions about the fact that they don't want to have any responsibility for their workers and they want to have workers uh, accept that that precarious work is inevitable. And we, and we see this by our politicians, where they say that, you know, well, you know, just get used to it. The, you know, it's, it's, it's the wave of the future. You're gonna have five or six uh, careers in your life, lifetime. You should be constantly training. You should be completely flexible. If your employer wants you, you should be there, right there, whatever they want you to be there. And, and you shouldn't be saying anything because you should be grateful that you have a job. And so what we've been trying to do in our organizing has been to say, 
absolutely not. Like we should have expectations of decent work. We should be able to say, well, actually, you know what? If you're gonna pay me, I should at least be paid over the poverty line. You shouldn't be paying me to subsist in poverty. And why shouldn't I have full-time work? Why shouldn't I have um, equal pay for equal work? Just because you've hired me through a temp agency, why am I being paid 40% less? And so I think pushing people to critically question what's going on and then move beyond that to action and to actually organizing is I think what uh, the Workers Action Center and some of the campaigns that we've been involved with, with you know, many union allies and community groups have, have been trying to sort of, you know, I guess, uh, inspire across the province with workers and with, with different organizations and unions. So I think it's really important that we understand uh, when we're doing community organizing and when we're asking to work with allies and to get support for the different issues that we're working on, that we understand um, what power we have and what power do the people that we have that we're asking to work with us. Right now in Ontario, for instance, we have um, 30% unionization rate. So 60% of workers in Ontario rely on basic employment standards. And so when you look at basic employment standards, we have no paid sick days. Um, there, is no, there is no just cause protection. Um, people cannot speak out if they have a violation of their right at work without losing their jobs, because that's what happens every single day. And so if those are the people that we're asking to get involved in our campaigns, then we need to understand um, the privilege that we have and the power that we have. And so I think it's, it's really critical to, to understand that if, if you have a lot of benefits, if you have a lot of, if you have good wages, um, if you have a collective agreement, if you have a union, um, if uh, you have a pension, that you are basically part of a very privileged group of workers. And so when you're fighting for your own improvements, better collective agreements, better language, it's gonna be really hard to get support for those issues because everyone around you in your community has nothing. And so it's critical that what we see is building of alliances between union and non-union workers so that we are raising the floor for everyone. Because if the floor is so low, all of our conditions, all of our wages, all of our benefits are gonna go right down as well. And this is basically what we've been seeing over the last 20, 30 years, is a huge challenge at our collective bargaining tables, when uh, we've been trying to push for better wages and working conditions, um, if we have a union, um, there has been very little gain made because you're surrounded by everyone who has nothing. And there's a lot of resentfulness there because why should they fight for you for 15 paid sick days, for instance, when they have zero? And so if we don't understand those connections, if we don't understand that we have to, first of all, ensure that everyone has at least a basic floor, then we can fight for more. But we can't have some people that have a great, great floor and great benefits and great conditions, everybody else is down there and then expect them to fight for us. And so part of the Fight for 15 and Fairness campaign and part of the work that we've been doing at the Workers' Action Center has been trying to build those alliances, trying to um, understand that if we are to build better wages and working conditions and better public education, better health care, stronger community services, stronger public service jobs, and, and obviously a strong, um, you know, better working conditions in the private sector, we need to bring everybody up. We can't leave anyone behind. And that means understanding who is left behind and why they're being left behind. And, and we know when we look at the labor market, it is, it is racialized. We also need to make the connections with workers who are coming in through the migrant worker program. Women, immigrant women are making 54 cents on the dollar. Um, compared to you know white women who are making 72 cents on the dollar, which is still an absolute shame. But we have to understand that 
Poor working conditions and poor wages are also uh, differentially impact different workers. So I'm a parent of two girls and uh, I, of course, am really interested in the education that they're getting in our public school system. And so at the elementary level, I have been organizing with other parents. And so in my daughter's school, um, we formed a social justice committee of parents. And this was probably about six years ago. We were wanting to work with teachers and other parents and to work with our kids to to try to have you know conversations around issues of social justice and why things were happening so we were obviously noticing that there was always a Thanksgiving food drive there were um, a lot of uh, charitable um, events organized at the school which was great but the children were not asking why they were doing it why 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 was it important that they, you know, try and get food for the food hampers for Thanksgiving? Why was it that families in our communities don't have enough to eat and rely on food banks? So part of a social justice agenda is about talking about working conditions, quality education, ensuring that teachers have what they need to do the jobs that they need, that schools have what they need. And so obviously when contract negotiations were happening between the teachers and the government and Bill 115 was introduced, we didn't see that as a separate issue. It was very much an issue that we, we were concerned about. And then the conversation for the Social Justice Committee was, what can we do to support the teachers? What can we do to show the government that we believe in good quality public education and that we are concerned around classroom sizes. We are concerned that teachers should have the professional development that they need and the kinds of wages and working conditions that they need to, to do the job that they need. It was a, a very natural thing for us to then organize um, an action at Queen's Park and, and reach out to a whole bunch of other schools in the neighborhood that we're located in and to bring our kids, to bring parents, to have some really hard conversations with other parents to try to get them to out to the rally, but also to do leafleting to other parents and talk to them about the issues. And so over the years, that work has been really important because it's built relationships with teachers in our school. And so I think it's really vital that uh, teachers work with parents to create those spaces where you can work together, build relationships that are ongoing, where you're organizing events that are not necessarily related to traditional forms of, of, of solidarity work, but maybe it's about organizing a workshop on, on diversity. Maybe it's, it's supporting the parents and they really want to make sure there's gender neutral washrooms in their school because you know there's a number of children dealing with transgender issues i mean i think anything that supports the building of a relationship around common issues and concerns i think are really critical because those can be building blocks to having those harder conversations around how governments make decisions around you know cutbacks to public services or to education or healthcare but you can't have those conversations on the fly those conversations have to be part of a long-term effort and have to be part of of relationships that you've been building for a long time and where you've had a chance to get to know each other and work together and talk about other issues and what people are concerned about. And, and what I find is that, that the committee has, has played that role for us to get to know each other. And, you know, if you get parents connected in the kindergarten years, I mean, they're going to be with you for six to seven years, right? Depending on, um, you know, whether you go to grade six or grade eight. And so that really is a long term in, in you know, in, in activism and in organizing. You know, if you have the potential to recruit someone and, and to get them engaged in the next six years, that's pretty good. And so I think it's a, a real um, important investment for anyone to be thinking about is how do you think through how people can come together to have you know, conversations around equity and, and social justice.
So I think my five steps around organizing are pretty basic, but I think are pretty critical to building a strong foundation. Because I think if, if your scaffolding is really weak, your efforts are never gonna be sustained. And so I, I would say that my, my first step would be mapping out who your allies are, who's in your school, who has a voice, who doesn't have a voice, who might share a common agenda, who are the people that you never see at the parents' council meetings, who are the allies in the community where children and teachers and parents are interacting, the local business, the local church, the local daycare, you know, the local convenience store where the kids all buy their candy. I mean, those are, those are who I would be mapping out first and figuring out who I want to reach out to them and, and why. I think then working with those folks, working with parents and working with teachers to figure out an agenda. And let's be really clear whose agenda it is. Is it a shared agenda? Is it one person's agenda? Is it the agenda of someone who has the most power in the room? Are we making sure that there's a consensus around that agenda? I think that that's really critical. Because again, if people don't own it and are not invested in it, they ain't gonna stay, right? The third piece for me would be then um, using a range of strategies. So ensuring that you don't just use one way of communicating or one way of doing outreach, but you use a multiple layer of, of strategies. And so that you're not just pigeonholing people and saying, well, the only way to affect change is through letter writing. Oh, the only way is through a petition. We need a range of strategies that can inspire people to get involved. So it could be having a fun action, a pop-up party uh, where the kids get involved and they do a lemonade stand and it could be a lemonade stand for, for equity or a lemonade stand to highlight the fact that, you know, there aren't enough dollars in the school and so you have to resort to a lemonade stand to raise money for the for the for the education that you're trying to provide in your school. I mean different ways that people can relate and can connect. We've certainly done that in the fight for 15 and fairness. We we've we we've done all kinds of crazy things. But the thing is is that they have to be fun. They have to be interesting. Yes, you can do your traditional letter writing and petitions and meetings, but also have some fun actions that parents can get engaged in and that can get their kids involved, right? And the community involved. I think then for me, the next step would be ensuring that you're actually achieving what you've set out to do and that you don't get distracted by bureaucracy and you don't get distracted by different agendas. I think really trying to actually, you know, if you're going to organize something and you're trying to do something, do it. Because people are wanting to see that happen. They're not just wanting a policy brief on a shelf or just go to endless meetings and you just talk and talk and talk and talk and nothing ever happens. And so I think the action piece is, is quite critical. And I think the other piece I would say make sure that you're building the capacity of everyone that's involved in your committee that you ensure that everyone has a chance to be a leader and that you're building skills you're trying to get new people that you don't have just one diva that is the shining light and that no one else gets to be the shining light because that is not sustainable and I think one of the things that I've learned is that if for our work to be sustainable on the long term, the investment that we make in, in making sure that everyone gets a seat at the table and that everyone is supported to be at that table is really important. So I think if you have those five pieces working together, I think that gives you a strong scaffolding to actually do some work and to actually start to build a strong foundation because you'll have the leadership, you'll have a range of activities, you'll, you'll have a power analysis of who's at the table and who's not, you'll have mapped out your allies, and you'll have an agenda that everybody's invested in. So I think if I was gonna give advice to teachers 
getting involved in this campaign around public education is to, is to really look hard and map your schools out and to see what strengths you have there, but to also see who should be part of the conversation and not just go the easy route. It's really important that we reach out to those communities and those parents of, of children that have been marginalized, that maybe are facing racism, are dealing with issues of poverty, that are in precarious jobs, because they will be your strongest allies because frankly, they get it. They understand what it means to struggle on a daily basis and they are fighting for their children every single day. But it has to also be a partnership. It cannot be a one-way street. So when we're going out and talking about public education, we also need to be talking about what are you concerned about? What is the thing that keeps you up at night? What are, you, what are your fears for your children? Are you afraid of the fact that, you know, you're gonna have to move from your apartment? because you can't pay your rent or because there's cockroaches in that apartment or you know you don't feel safe on the streets like what are the issues that that parent is concerned and what are you going to do to support them in their community and in their neighborhood in their home because if they don't see that it's a two-way street and they don't see that you care about what their issues are, why should they care about your issues, even though their child is in your classroom? And so I think it really requires um, reaching out, doing a lot of listening, trying to make the linkages with what people are experiencing in their community and understanding those points of connection between what you might be fighting for as a teacher and what they might be fighting for just to struggle to make it through the end of the day. And I think if we don't understand that, if we don't understand what that common agenda is and how we can work together, we're not gonna move this discussion forward. So I think that there's a real source of strength in our communities. It's just about understanding how you can build those relationships and how you can tap into those connections and that parental and community support.